Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome again to God's Unchanged Word, and this week's special edition of News, Nuggets, and Insights, back-to-back -back weekends of holidays. Today is Friday, November 17th, 2017. Of course, we're going to talk about Thanksgiving is going to be the highlight of our program, and we're going to tell that story through videos that we're bringing in that we've collected that I think you're going to find of, of major interest. But we're also going to talk about a couple of serious issues that's going on in America. The first one is they call evil good, where we're going to build on a subject we introduced last week. And then we're going to talk about attacking the good. And we've talked about this now for the last couple of years, how this sentiment in America has been changing very rapidly to not only fight with those who disagree, but to eliminate those who do not agree with the sectarian view of, of uh, God being removed in our society. So let's start with a video that we're going to be bringing in from the History Channel about Thanksgiving. This video is about five minutes long, gives you a view of uh, Thanksgiving and all its changes from the very beginning. So if we're ready, let's start our program today with the video on Thanksgiving from the History Channel. To most Americans, the Pilgrims of Plymouth, Massachusetts are the iconic inspiration for today's Thanksgiving feast. After the winter of 1620 killed almost half of their people, the colonists formed a relationship with the neighboring Wampanoag tribe, who taught them about fishing, planting, and hunting. By autumn of 1621, the colonists had collected enough food to feed the community through the coming winter. The Wampanoags joined the colonists for a three-day feast in honor of their bounty. The feast probably did not include our modern Thanksgiving staple, turkey. More likely, the colonists and Wampanoags dined on roast goose, along with corn, codfish, and lobster. This 1621 harvest meal is now commonly thought of as the first Thanksgiving. Yet for later generations of colonists, New England days of Thanksgiving had little to do with the 1621 Harvest Festival. Theirs was a religious holiday, descended from Puritan days of fasting, prayer, and giving thanks to God. Every autumn, the governor of each colony would declare days of thanksgiving for bountiful harvests, victorious battles, or drought-ending rains. In 1777, the Continental Congress decreed that all 13 of America's colonies celebrate a national day of thanksgiving that year in celebration of their victory over the British at Saratoga. By the mid-19th century, many states celebrated the holiday. However, the date could vary by weeks or even months. A determined magazine editor named Sarah Josepha Hale set about establishing a national Thanksgiving day. She passionately believed that such a day would help unite a nation headed toward civil war. Hale began a one-woman letter-writing campaign, urging politicians to establish an annual day of Thanksgiving. Her efforts were finally rewarded by Abraham Lincoln, who saw the unifying potential of the holiday. In 1863, four months after the victory at Gettysburg, he declared the last Thursday of November to be Thanksgiving Day. By the 20th century, Thanksgiving was a welcome day of leisure from a six-day work week. In the 1920s, the National Football League was formed. In an effort to boost attendance, the fledgling Detroit Lions devised the concept of a Thanksgiving Day game. Parades also became a Turkey Day tradition, and department stores quickly saw their value as a kickoff to the Christmas shopping season. The Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade began in 1924, and year after year, millions of New Yorkers braved the cold to watch the festivities. Most of all, Thanksgiving is about family. With modern life moving faster than ever, Thanksgiving gives us a day to take a collective breath, reconnect with loved ones, and remember just how much we have to be thankful for. A lot to be thankful for in America. We've got a couple more videos coming in before the end of the program, including one you've probably never seen before, talking about information tied to Thanksgiving that you're going to find very surprising for our church. All right, so let's go on. Let's bring in something now that's just the last minute I threw this in just before we got the program uh, today is about the earthquake in diverse places. We're familiar with the scripture in Matthew 24, verse 7, where it states, 
The nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. So God was talking about toward the end of the time that there'd be an increase in earthquakes and be in different places. Well, just the other day then, another earthquake, Iran and Iraq. Now, this is an early figure, and it's going to change by the time you get this on Friday, since we're taping on Tuesday. They're talking about more than 450 people killed at the border of Iraq and Iran. And that's just one of the, of the uh, uh, earthquakes, because there's been as many as 30 over the last month, and this was the, the greatest of them, and expecting even more tremors to come afterwards. So I wanted to bring that out, and I want to show you a chart, because we haven't talked about the earthquakes a lot since we brought in um, uh, Mexico just a few weeks ago. But take a look at this chart that I have here. This was, this was made uh, a couple years ago, and as you can see, the earthquake uh, movement and growth coming into 2000 through 2010, look at 2010 to 2015, the increased activity of earthquakes. And they're taking place in, in different places, just like the Bible said. Now, here's a chart that I want to bring out that was brought up back in 2007. All right, this is 2007, so this was 10 years ago. And they were predicting, because of the increased activity in, their, in the way they read these, uh, the, the seismic scales, they knew that we're on an ever accelerating course of more and more earthquake activity. Take a look at this. This is when they, when they said that uh, is going to continue to increase. All right, this is where we are now. This is where they had it in 2007. Look what they had here. And they're actually not very far off. They're actually underestimating the amount of earthquakes that are actually taking place right now. So as we see, as time goes on, these earthquakes are going to get greater and greater and greater. So I wanted to bring that to the attention because the book of Revelation talks about at the time when Christ comes back just before, there's going to be huge, massive earthquakes. And they're looking at some of the, the uh, epicenters, as they call them, around the world now that are, are moving and shaking and, and actually helping to create some volcano activity. So we're moving into a time where the Bible talks about not only the diverse activities, but a time where it's going to be detrimental for human life. So I just wanted to bring that out as we see this here to put it back on your radar. So if you don't have it on your radar, it's one of the things that you want to begin to take a look at. So now let's talk about the focus of the week. They call evil good, evil good. Today's focus they call evil good. So let's look at that and see in respect of what's going on today. All right. This I'm talking about disrespect for civil authority. Now, to discuss this, I'm bringing in what we talked about last week. Is it was an event of the world growing without God. So that was just last week's program. Now, this is the slide where we talked about a world without God. This was from the National Geographic, published on April 22, 2016. The world's newest major religion is no religion. All right? This was Secularism Grows. Atheists and agnostics are trying to expand and diversify their ranks. And this is what it says. More people than ever are identifying as agnostic or otherwise non-religious with the potentially world-changing effects. Now, that was back in April of last year. So what are we looking at today? This world that's changing without God no longer can just tolerate those who believe in God. So what is it doing? It's altering our society and the way we look at things, the way we look at our American heroes. Let me bring something out to you. Now, you may not think this is very important. You've probably seen it on the news, and you probably think it's no big deal. People just don't know what they're doing. <clears throat> this month, in GQ magazine, all right, this month, they awarded as Citizen of the Year, Colin Kaepernick. You got that? Colin Kaepernick. Now, if you don't know who Colin Kaepernick is, you probably haven't been following football. He's the guy who began taking the knee during the national anthem, which is his third a controversy across the globe and began to pit people one against another, even players against one another, owners against their people. And so we're in the middle of all of this. In the middle of all of that, they announced him as the citizen of the year. 
So here's the all-important question I want to leave with you today as we go through this. What is he being awarded for? What is he being awarded for? What has he done for our society other than protest, show disrespect? Here's what he's being awarded for as an example for our youth. The total disrespect of civil authority. One of the things that he's done that he's notarized for, that he's been given praise for, is I don't know if you can see this or not, but right here on his socks, and you can see him wearing it, his disrespect for civil authority as he talks about police officers as being pigs. No respect whatsoever. Now, if you got a complaint, you do it in the proper way and you take it through the proper channels. You don't take the opportunity to use your beliefs to disrespect your nation, your country, and set the example for the youth, police or pigs. And that's been a, been a motto he's brought about for, for, for years now. What about this? This was another magazine. Talked about his perilous plight, poor soul. Poor soul takes a, takes a knee, disrespects the flag, and all those who have died for that flag for years and years and years. So now this is important for you and I who are in God's church who understand that this nation was brought about through God through a promise to Abraham that this is a modern nation, a modern day Israel. And God says those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. This has no possibility bringing about blessings in this nation. Everything we look at we have to view from God's perspective. And this is just one of those things that continues to bring on disrespect for the end time. Matthew 24 says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. So as we're seeing, as the lawlessness abounds, the way to, to challenge those who disagree with them is to attack, to riot, to burn, to loot, to maim, and even to kill. And we're seeing that right now. Rather than our society keeping things in place in civil order, there is the approval of civil disobedience. And you're seeing that now, changing our nation. Why is it being changed? Just as we reported last week, the removal of God brings a society that has no God. Without God, there is no right and there is no wrong. You're in the time of the judges where everybody does what is right in their own eyes. Now, I'm going to take it one step further. All right, so we're going we're gonna to show you a video when we come back. We're going to take another subject that we brought in last week, and we're going to bring it to the next level of escalating the evil that's rising in our society. We're going to talk about the assault on the victims at the shooting in Texas. All right, we're going to talk about the assault with the shooting in Texas. So here we have our Thanksgiving Day video. You got it? I did this on purpose. I just wanted to bring this out. This is just Tom's way of showing something. What did I write here? Can you read it? Anybody here can read that? All right, let me show you what that is. It just says video. And the name of the video is Awesome Thanksgiving Day Video. Why did I bring that out? Because we live in America. And God says, and we should use this in church all the time, is that if you're going to speak in an unknown tongue, and that was a Hebrew tongue, but it's unknown to people here. If there's no interpreter, you don't use it. So I just thought I'd bring that out to try to show you an example that when we begin using unknown tongues and nobody knows what they are. All right, so let's take a break. I'm going to show you how awful things are getting. It takes this little short video. It's about a minute and a half long called Awesome Thanksgiving, and I'll be right back. Thanksgiving is just around the corner. For the sake of accuracy, I decided to take stock of my life to see just how thankful I should be. On the plus side, I have one house, half paid for, two cars, both in need of an oil change, one greasy push mower, seven pairs of penny loafers, and about 10,000 pieces of junk. I decided this adds up to mildly to moderately thankful. But then I had to subtract. On the minus side, one broken leg, the flu, and two seasonal colds already this year, three parking tickets, one annoying hey. new neighbor, and about 10,000 frustrating traffic encounters. So the piles pretty much canceled each other out. And just when I was thinking how clean and symmetrical it all was, I remembered that I exist. That the being who caused that existence filled it with people for me to love and be loved by. I wasn't sure how this fit in my piles. And then I remembered that, that same being also loved me. Me. 
I started getting nervous. My symmetrical calculations were starting to topple into a big pile of irrelevance. I protested. What about my pain? What about my bad days and my broken hearts? And a voice whispered back, You break my heart every day, but I still love you. Love you enough to die for you. But we thought that's a cute little video because it's actually God who does it all. And as we go through all things, we would be happy and thankful in all things because He is the one who gives us the rights that we have in our society today, not the government. These are unalienable rights given to us by our Creator. Biblical Nuggets. Now, now let's bring all this into our Biblical Nuggets portion of the program, good, evil, evil, good. Now that's a phrase that comes from Isaiah 5. So let's read that right quick. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now we'll be covering this in a sermon. We're going to cover this chapter a lot more as time goes on, but this is the crux of the time element that we're living in in our society today. We need to understand something, is that society is quickly changing, and that change is, is the continual removal of God. And as you continue to, to live in that society under the rules that God gave rather than those of this land, you're continually becoming a threat to those who are trying to take over the nation and take God out of it. And this is where it all goes to. God says you're gonna, they're going to call evil good and good evil. Now here's the problem. The generations that are coming up today, the little ones, they're being taught. And over the last 50 years, we as a society have taken our youth and turned them over to a society that is removing God. So at generation after generation are now teaching the new youth to come up that all the principles that brought the greatness of this nation are being removed. So as they reach to the age of decision and accountability, they don't know the difference between right and wrong. So let me give you an example of how far this can get. When a child in the Middle East, as little as four, five, six, eight years old, can take a gun and murder other people, blow up buses, men, women, and children, and think it's justified and is right before God and they bring in God honor, you can see how far a society can become perverted. Now, we're not gone that far yet, but we've gone as far as this nation not allowing the Christians to believe the things that they believe according to the Bible. No longer are we allowed to be able to exist on our own because they're coming after those who oppose the new views. Now, I'm going to show you this today in the video as we go through this. Let's take the example from last week, the shooting in the Texas church. Remember this we brought up last year, last week. 26 killed, 20 wounded in the small Texas community church. So now let's take a look at that example. Now if we understand how, how evil that was. So let's look at the example of good and evil, evil good in the light of last week's shooting. I'm calling it attacking the good. Now I'm going to show you this example who's by Laura Ingram. For those who don't know, she's got a new television program, comes on Fox Network, 9 o'clock Central Time. I'm not, I'm not encouraging and telling people to watch it. But I caught this little segment in her program last week, and it, it actually exemplifies pretty much everything that we've been talking about over the last 10 years of how our society is changing and how the, those who are conservative Christians who live by godly values or, or now they can't exist without being attacked by the left and, and th by those with our, uh, that are ungodly. I believe it's about five minutes long. There's one or two things in it that, of course, we don't, under we don't agree with. And, she, of course, she doesn't understand the truth as we do now. But please listen to the principles of what she's bringing forth to the general public that we have been talking about and preaching as hard as we can for the last 10 years and especially over the last three years. So if we've got that video ready, let's play that now. Elite hostility to people of faith. That's the subject of tonight's angle. In the aftermath of the church massacre in Texas, all of us were outraged and heartbroken. Across social media, politicians and concerned Americans everywhere remembered the victims 
and offered the grieving families of Sutherland Springs their thoughts and prayers. But almost immediately, celebrities and certain media types rushed to ridicule and demean that religious sentiment. Actor Michael McKean in a tweet wrote, they were in church. They had the prayer shot right out of them. Maybe try something else. Stephen King, whose Dark Tower series features a gunslinger, T tweeted, enough with praying, time to start legislating. The hostility to faith infects the popular culture. There is militant secularism moving throughout the country that not only disparages people of faith, but targets them because of it. Entertainment and media elites caricature people like those in that church in Sutherland Springs as intolerant, backwood yahoos, they're Bible thumpers, when they're actually among the best of America. They may not be the fancy people out on the red carpets or in the gym with their personal trainers, but when the chips are down and help is needed, they'll put their own lives on the line, pick up a long gun if needed, and go save their neighbors. If you pay close attention, these elites are not only trying to politicize this tragedy, but they're disparaging the faith of the people killed in those pews. Actor Will Wheaton, responding to Speaker Paul Ryan's call for prayer, he wrote, the murdered victims were in a church. If prayers did anything, they'd still be alive. You worthless sack of. So prayer is incapable of doing anything. Hmm. What, if they were having brunch at the Peninsula Hotel with their managers, they might still be here? Is that your point, Will? No wonder he spells his name with only one L. It's William, two L's. The intolerance uh, of religion, it's penetrated every corner of the culture. When esteemed Notre Dame law professor Amy Barrett was nominated to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, she was grilled by Democratic senators, not really for her legal reasoning, not so much, but for her Catholic faith. Dick Durbin asked if she considered herself an Orthodox Catholic. He didn't mention that she has seven children, but he might as well have. Senator Dianne Feinstein went even further. She suggested that, quote, the dogma lives loudly within you, and that's a concern. Can you imagine either of those senators trying that on a Muslim court nominee? Uh, no, they wouldn't. Despite the religious hazing, Barrett was confirmed last week. Good. This is an intimidation campaign that has been tried and tried again, even on yours truly. I didn't even know about this, by the way, until a few days ago, but following the debut of this show last week, a bright light at something called theobserver.com dubbed me the church lady. Church lady was pretty funny, by the way, because I quote, appeared before the audience in purple vestments, that's a dress, by the way, that highlighted the gleaming gold cross on my chest. Here it is. It's really powerful. Uh, as expected, the cross-hating author is a former New York Times employee and a segment producer for Keith Olbermann. Figures. Last week, a high school football coach in Georgia was told that he can't participate in any student-initiated or student-led prayer before or after or during a football game. So he can't pray at all in his official capacity as a coach. The Coweta County School Board directive came only after the Freedom From Religion Foundation filed a complaint. You see, the atheists aren't happy unless they're trampling on another person's religious liberty. We'd better be very careful. Remember, the Declaration of Independence, ever heard of it? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our natural rights are not dependent on the government, but on God. That is what undergirds this country and, frankly, what sustains us. And for those of you who don't agree, you're in my thoughts and prayers. Get over it. That's the angle. Well, as you can see, I mean, she covered it pretty, pretty in depth in just a very short span of time. That's what we've been talking about. Now, you need to carry this further that as the churches continue to give in to the intolerance 
and just remain silent, it's eventually going to reach the point that they'll be turned over to a non-godly society. When that happens, eventually they're going to come against God's churches. Now, right now, God has kept us under the radar, all right, under the radar right now. And it's, I believe, for one reason and one reason only, is to continue to preach a warning message before the returning Jesus Christ. And in that, it's given the church time to be able to get his act together, to do that work. And if it has any problems at all, as we brought out in a recent sermon, when he put in the second year in the millennium, which I'll mention again at the end of this program, to repent and get his act together and to serve God with that first love, with the intensity of that zeal that we had from the beginning time. So I wanted to bring that out to you because, you see, the world sees what's going on, but they're giving into it. And as soon as that light pops up, like Laura Ingram, it brings about hatred that is just undefinable as the intensity grows against the God godly values of our society. So I hope you appreciate what was brought there. And in fact, if you can, share this, share this news, nuggets, and insights with everybody you know so they can see what's going on. Because this is not just our church preaching it. This is an awareness that's going on around our society. And believe it or not, they're getting away with it. Time's going to run out. If we don't speak up now, we won't have a chance to later. Look what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But mark this, Timothy was saying. He says, look, that's what he says now. He says, pay attention now. He says, what I'm about to tell you, he said, mark this. And I'm telling you, do like Timothy says, mark this. In other words, put it in your mind, put it in your, the forefront of your, of your awareness and your conscience that there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusers, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous and rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. We live in a society that's almost impossible to do anything because, you see, this permeates our society. It's in television. It's in movies. It's in the airways. It's, it's on people's phones now. It's their headphones as they walk around everywhere. And it's from the youth, from the littlest up to the, to the, the oldest in our society. We are in the time of what Timothy said. So I'm telling you, like Timothy, mark that down because God's saying don't have any part with this. If you do, then you're going to be sucked into the society and you're going to be drifted away from God's truth. All right, that's, that's what I wanted to cover this week because I'm going to cover some more of it next week because I want to get back into some of the historical values of, of uh, the History Channel. But those things are very important that we're covering and we're going to go a lot more in depth because next week we're going to take this to the next level of uh, infiltration of our beliefs. So here's, here's what's going on right now. Here's the question I'm asking. Has America changed the, the biblical safe haven of innocent until proven guilty? Now, I ask this question because right now there's, there's a judge. Uh, I don't remember his name. I think it's Roy Moore. And, and I don't know anything about him. I don't know anything about the stories. But hear me tell you what's happening in the last couple months. As soon as someone raises an accusation against someone, the society immediately has to go and destroy that individual and remove them, whether they're guilty or not. And until this time in our society, you are proven, you are innocent until proven guilty. No longer does that seem to be the effect. And that is a biblical principle, and that's why you're seeing this change. Now, why is this important? Because you see, at the end of Christ's life, when they couldn't get him any other way, they had suborned witnesses who lied about him and accused him of certain things that eventually brought about his death. And Jesus Christ says, what they have done to me, they will do to you. So we're beginning now to move into the time. So you see, the entire society is, is, uh, is changing to even to a point all it's going to take is just one person who disagrees with your belief, a family member who is upset because another family member might be attending to keep the truth as we understand it. 
to, to be able to stop that person, just go into society, create a lie, and have everyone go after that individual to destroy them and destroy the truth. If you don't believe it'll happen to us, look at your scripture in Jesus Christ. They did it to him. He said they will do it to you. And I'm going to go through that specifically, the escalation of those who went after Jesus Christ and how he eventually brought about his death. And we're going to begin to see some of that down the road as we go forward. All righty, from the web office in the mail this week, we put the sermon out, First Responders. Actually, that was last week, so I'm going to need to really update this. But if you didn't get your copy of First Responders, please write for it, or you can go online and take a look at there. Last week, we put in the mail, and this is going to be current, the newsletter, a free monthly offering for November. This was the sermon I did at the Feast of Tabernacles that I'm actually redoing it now in a Bible study format. It's called Two Years into the millennium. It's a very important, hard-hitting message talking about, believe it or not, the day of the Lord and the times that we are in today. So I asked the question in it, and I'll ask that with you. I'm not going to give you the answer. I want you to get the sermon. God says He'll do nothing, but He reveal His secret unto His servants first. So now, if we are in the time, or getting close to the time of the day of the Lord, what has God revealed to us that we haven't known for generations or in the church? I cover that in this sermon, so make sure you get the sermon. Two years into the millennium. It'll be mailed up in about two weeks, I think, at the end of the month. From the vault, we had from the vault that we're keeping up there from last, the last couple weeks is the uh, America Sold Out. This is uh, one we did back in 2013. Um, this is not the American Decline that was done in 2015 or 16. This is 2013. It's three parts. Talking about the fiscal cliff, our financial responsibility, about the Middle East Spring and how things are changing. And by the way, things are changing pretty rapidly right now in Iran. So that's something we're going to be covering in the future if you haven't paid attention. They're, messing, they're having a massive upheaval in, in uh, I, I'm sorry, Saudi Arabia right now. So the Middle East is really moving in, in ways that uh, they've not seen in decades. Then, of course, the embarkation of America. Has America lost its way? So we can look back four or five years ago, and you can see that America has changed tremendously in just the last few years. So we cover that in those three sermons of where America was going, and believe it or not, we're there today. Some of the things that we talked about just four and five years ago. I was up in Syracuse last week. This was the building that we were able to purchase for the congregation up there. I'm going to have pictures and a story in a quarterly that's going to come out at the end of the month. The brethren came together for an area-wide, sort of like an open house to let everybody know where they were. And we actually had 63 in attendance. They had a great time. We had fellowship. They had lots and lots of food. In fact, they didn't shut it down until like 9, 30, 10 o'clock that night before people were going home because everybody was so excited to be together up there. So we're actually preparing for now the dedication weekend for this is going to be Pentecost weekend. That's the dedication weekend. They want to get in there, want to do some modification on the inside. They want to be able to spruce it up, give it a facelift. And God willing, they'll have it ready for Pentecost weekend. And everyone's invited. Hope you'll come up. They're making arrangements with the hotels to get some discounts. It'll be a great weekend up in Syracuse, Indiana. Put it on your, put it on your schedule and take a look. All right, Thanksgiving Day. We got a video here. This is the last video we want to play. Again, it's about five minutes long. <clears throat> I came across this, actually, it was sent to me in my email about Thanksgiving. It's got some really interesting insights that uh, you may not have heard before and that the world doesn't know. So take a look at this and we'll come back and we'll close our program back in just a few moments. Food, football, and oppression. That's what Thanksgiving has come to mean to many Americans. Back in 2007, Seattle public school officials made national news by describing the holiday as a time of mourning and a bitter reminder of 500 years of betrayal. This new narrative describes the pilgrims as arrogant oppressors who fled persecution only to become persecutors themselves, depriving Native Americans of their land and their lives. But this is wrong on every count. First of all, the pilgrims didn't cross the ocean to flee persecution or even England. They'd been living for over a decade in Holland, 
Europe's most tolerant nation and a haven for religious dissenters. Free from interference by the Church of England, they feared seduction, not persecution, worrying that their children would be corrupted by the materialistic Dutch culture. That's why they risked their dangerous 1620 voyage to a wilderness continent, not because they were running from oppression, but because they were running toward holiness, fulfilling a fateful mission to build an ideal Christian commonwealth. They initially planned to plant this model society on the wild, wolf-infested island known to natives as Manhattan. But winds and tides blew them 250 miles off course, dumping the Mayflower on the frozen coast of Massachusetts. Somehow, the pilgrims saw their dire situation as a demonstration of providential power, especially after a giant wave picked up the flimsy boat of a scouting party on a stormy December night. The turbulent sea then deposited them safely, miraculously, on a little island within sight of the ideal location for their settlement. It was a deserted Indian village with cleared land, stored supplies of corn, and a reliable source of fresh water. No, these supposedly cruel conquerors never actually invaded that village. Instead, they expressed a fervent desire to pay the natives for the dried corn they found. If only they could find someone to pay. But the former inhabitants had perished during three years of plague, probably smallpox, that immediately preceded the pilgrim's arrival. One of the few survivors of that devastation turned up several months later to welcome the English newcomers. Against all odds, he proved to be the single human being on the continent best suited to help the struggling settlers, since he spoke English and had already embraced Christianity. His name was Squanto, and he had grown up in this very village before a ruthless sea captain kidnapped him as a boy and sold him into slavery in Spain. After four years, he was freed by kindly monks, then made his way to England, and finally sailed across the Atlantic only to find his friends and family all wiped out by disease. Over the next few months, Squanto helped the English newcomers plant crops and negotiate a friendly trade agreement with the region's most important chief, Massasoit. No wonder pilgrim leader William Bradford called Squanto a special instrument sent of God for their good. The celebration, later known as the First Thanksgiving, actually involved a three-day harvest festival in October, apparently inspired by the biblical holiday of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Ninety hungry Indian warriors joined the 53 surviving pilgrims for this occasion. Nearly half of the colonists had died during the brutal winter. The Englishmen provided some vegetables, fish, and perhaps wild turkeys, while the natives brought five recently hunted deer as house gifts. The preferred sport on this occasion wasn't football, but shooting, with settlers and Indians sharing a fierce fascination with guns. Though these hardy pilgrims loom large in the American imagination, they never built their Plymouth settlement into a major colony. And nearby Boston, the later colony of Massachusetts Bay, grew so much faster that it swallowed up the great-grandchildren of the pilgrims in 1691. But the sense of purpose of the original pilgrims left a permanent imprint on the national character. They maintained unshakable confidence that God protected them, not to grant special privileges, but to impose special responsibilities. They saw themselves as instruments, not authors, of a mysterious master plan. Today, with our continued blessings so obvious and so overwhelming, the only reason to treat this beloved national holiday as a time of mourning is that some foolish Americans actually think that's a good idea. The pilgrims knew better. They understood that people of every culture and every era can gain more from gratitude than from guilt. Well, as Paul Harvey used to say, and now you know the rest of the story. That's a story that most Americans has never heard before, 
and maybe you haven't heard it either, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't know some of that myself. Never heard it until I saw this video. So I hope you enjoyed that, and you hope you enjoyed our special presentation. <clears throat> hope everyone has a, a very special uh, Thanksgiving day. Enjoy it with your family. Enjoy it with the food and fellowship and whatever it is that you do on that special day. Well, that's it for news, nuggets, and insights for this week. And as Turkey Tom says, save a turkey, eat more beef. And of course, Mrs. Cow says, eat more turkey. So until next week, God be with you. This is Tom for News, Nuggets, and Insights to next week.